evening, everyone. Welcome to Elba. Let's get going. The topic tonight is the first man, his surroundings, the boundaries God sets for him, and the helper God's, God makes for him. Once again, the topic tonight is Genesis 2, the first man, his surroundings, the boundaries God sets for him, and the helper God makes for him. Uh, Genesis 2 is the more personalized, zoomed-in, recap version of a creation account uh, contrasting with Genesis 1 was which is the more zoomed out creation account we can think of Genesis 1 as a little bit more from God's perspective and a global perspective what did creation look like we're looking at Genesis 2 on a much more local level what did creation look like um, in that specific vicinity where man was created Starting in verse 4, uh, we, we didn't do chapter 1 and chapter 2. We did a little bit into chapter 2 because it, it talked about the seventh day God rested, right? In verse 4, it says, These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation. Now, depending on your translation, that and if you have paragraphs, that verse might be attached to the end of the first creation account. Or it might be attached to the beginning of the second creation account. By the way, the first and second creation account are not, uh, they are compatible. Again, it's just one is more global and uh, zoomed out and the other one is more local and zoomed in. Um, but that verse 4 could go with the end of the, of the first chapter or with the beginning of the second chapter. All right. Okay. Okay. Going on in uh, Genesis chapter 2. At that time, I'm reading from Genesis chapter 2. At that time, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. No shrub of the field had yet grown on the land, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not made it rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. But mist would come up from the earth and water all the ground. Verse 7, Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. We talked just briefly last week about uh, the creation account in the Bible uh, and some of the wording there uh, leading us to uh, view man as a special creation separate from the animals. And again, going back to that evolution idea, um, separate from the animals, distinct in category. Here we have another hint of that, uh, really not a hint, it's pretty verbatim. Forms man out of the ground and breathes into his nostrils. Not forming man out of some pre-man. Okay, so uh, this is a new creation, uh, Adam here. Okay, uh, Okay. now let's talk about Eden for just a second. So Eden uh, the Garden of Eden, but there's a, a, a uh, garden within this larger area called Eden. Uh, there are trees, God plants trees within this garden throughout, and there are two special trees, of course, and they are the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we'll return to that uh, for sure next week, uh, a little bit this week too, actually, and then more next week on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. Your questions for investigation that we just had. Here's one of them. The river that flows out of Eden, let me read it, verse 10. A river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there it divided and became the source of how many rivers? Four, Four rivers. Okay. The first, name of the first is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure. Bdellium and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which runs east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. In the original questions for investigation for the entire unit, I asked uh, what two rivers that are still uh, around today, we have these two rivers, uh, is the Garden of Eden near or, or around? And the answer was Tigris and Euphrates, not the Mississippi and the Missouri. Okay, All right. okay so these four rivers and, and Eden, I wanted to take just a second here to talk about uh, where Eden might be. Um, 
we don't know where Eden is for certain, uh, but I just wanted to, I just thought it was interesting and a little fun, so I wanted to do a, a little bit on that. Um, so the four rivers, Tigris and Euphrates are known. It is known where those t- four, two rivers are, uh, primarily in Iraq, modern-day Iraq. Um, and, uh, but the Gihon and the Pishon, we don't know what those are. Uh, they are not modern rivers. Uh, if they are st- a river that exists today and it's just renamed, we don't know which one it got renamed. Okay? So we, some people kind of look at these context clues and try to figure some things out. Okay, First question is, is the, is the, is the Eden and the garden, is it where the rivers diverge or where they converge? Okay, that will be, that answer to that question will give us two separate possibilities for where the garden is. Um, the, the modern Tigris and Euphrates River come down running south through Iraq and converge near the south, southern tip of Iraq and, and, and then flow into the Persian Gulf. So if it's where they converge, it would be more in that area. If it's where they uh, start, if, where the orig- rivers originate, then that would be much uh, further north in the area of, and I'll show this on a map in just a second, uh, e- eastern Turkey, west, northwestern Iran, Azerbaijan, that area, okay? Um, and so I'll show you that in just a second. So um, if we're going to figure out where the Garden of Eden is, which we won't, okay, but we've got to have these ingredients. One is a place where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers could conceivably come together, Okay. Two is an area where there's gold and precious stones. It talks about one of the rivers the, being in the region of Havilah, which is where there's gold and, and precious stones. Okay? And the third one is a way to explain that this other river is in Cush. Okay, and I'll s- say more about that in just a second. Well, I'll say more about it now. Cush is uh, generally in the Bible we, we talk about, and Pastor Jeff had a whole series on this uh, not long ago. Cush is generally referred to a region that's south of Egypt, so like Sudan and Ethiopia. And generally the thought is that that is not the area that we're talking about where this river comes from, so it has to be some other thing that the Bible refers to as Cush. And there are two possibilities. There are some words that sound like Cush that people say, well, this is what it meant. Okay, so we'll see what happens there. All right, so two theories here. Uh, for where the garden might be. The first one is the northern theory. Uh, And so there are the four rivers. The two on the left are the Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, And where they are currently, uh, roughly where they are currently, uh, starting in Turkey up there and going down through uh, Syria and Iraq and so forth. The other two rivers there that flow west to east and empty into the Caspian Sea uh, are the... Aras River flows along the border of Azerbaijan. They're the, the northern one. And then the next one is the Gezel Ozan River. Okay. There are some people who have put together that there's all these little things that come together that they think that that's where the Garden of Eden is. You got to remember that this is before the flood. So a lot of the geography is going to change. The rivers probably aren't even the same rivers. But they knew what those rivers were, so they knew where the Tigris and Euphrates were. And so Noah and the generations after, when they have this river here, was it, well, that's about where the Tigris was. And so they probably renamed it Tigris and so forth. Um, now, so that's one option, okay? And then the other option is the southern option. So where the rivers converge, uh, and this is true today, the Tigris and Euphrates converge down there, and then there's another river that's in western Iran, um, and that is called the Karun River, K-A-R-U-N, uh, that runs west to east and runs into these rivers over here. The one that runs, what did I just say? Yeah, the one that runs east to west across Iran is what I meant to say. The one that runs across Saudi Arabia here, across the northern bit of Saudi Arabia, is uh, not a real river, but there are satellite photos that show 
that there is a river bed there where there used to be a river. And in that area, there is gold. And so uh, some people say, well, that's Havilah, and that's where that river of Pishon, that's what that river is. If that's the case, then the converging point would be basically buried under the Persian Gulf today. Okay. Now, again, that's just, that, all that was just for fun. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. You know, when you read your um, early, early history books, um, the beginning of civilization, civilization, beginning of man, it talks about the beginning of man being in Mesopotamia, right? The first civilization, uh, this region there with the Tigris and Euphrates River. If anybody remembers ninth grade, uh, who remembers ninth grade? Well, maybe one or two, okay. But anyway, um, I, I just simply point out that it's always nice when the secular people agree with the Bible, when the secular people say, yeah, the beginning of civilization was around this Tigris-Euphrates area, and the Bible says the beginning of man was the Tigris-Euphrates area, well, that's nice that there's, there's an overlap there because it's not always the case. Uh, but in this case, uh, the, the, the science of archaeology and, 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 uh, um, is, is back supporting uh, what the Bible says there about how man it would it would be it would be a challenge if the Bible said that the Garden of Eden Eden was in Japan because that wouldn't jibe with what uh, the rest of the world says about that. Okay, in the remainder of the chapter two, we find six things ordained by God. Six things ordained by God. Okay, starting in verse fifteen. Starting in verse 15, six things ordained by God. The first one in verse 15 is work. We had this word just a second ago. The word translated till or tend or work or cultivate in Genesis 2.15, where Adam tended the garden, is elsewhere translated as serve as well as enslaved. It is translated serve other places in the Old Testament. It's translated enslaved other places in the Old Testament. And in Psalm 211, in some translations, it's translated worship. So in other places in the Bible, this, this word that means that he worked the land and tilled the garden. And, 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 and by the way, the Garden of Eden, Eden, you can think of it more as like a botanical garden. Um, he's, he's beautifying the countryside and 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 keeping it up um, like a like a botanical garden. Um, <clears throat> that word again is translated other places in the Bible as serve. It's also translated as enslaved, and it's translated as worship, which means it's not translated as strive. Okay, all right. Verse sixteen, we get the second thing God ordains, which is human volition. Human volition, in other words, free will. Yeah, that, was, that slide was out of order. That's supposed to be right there. Verse 16, human volition. In other words, free will. God says you are free to eat from any tree. Except one. But you are free to eat from any tree. God gives man the free will and the power to choose. Okay, verse 17, the third thing ordained by God is obedience. He says, he gives man the right and the wrong option. You're free to choose from any, eat, eat from any tree, except this one. So there's a statement there by God that says, don't do this. I expect obedience. You have a free will, but not that one. That one's off limits. And so um, he says, uh, on the day you eat from this tree, you will cer certainly die. He warns man of the consequence, so there's no excuse. See Romans 1.20. Okay, the fourth thing ordained by God here in Genesis 2 is community. Uh, it's not good for man to be alone, verse 18. It's not good for man to be alone. The fifth thing ordained by God in this passage is science, verse 19. This is a question for investigation uh, from, uh, from the previous, uh, from the beginning. God brought the animals to see what Adam would name them. 
Uh, the question early on said, God commanded Adam to name the animals. No. He did not command Adam to name the animals. He brought him the animals to see what he would name them. In other words, I think this is an important point. God made Adam with a brain. He brought him the animals with not a command, but an assumption. Of course, Adam is going to look at these animals and say what they are. In other words, God made Adam with a brain. He expects him to use it. John Lennox has referred to this as the first act of taxonomy, which is to say, looking at something, categorizing, making observations and categorizing and putting things into categories. Okay, when you ne- That's a tiger over there. That's an alligator over there. That's observing differences between things and putting a name or a title on it. Okay, that's basic science. Science is making observations, organizing those observations, and making titles and categories and saying, here's, this is this and that's that. Let me say that again. Science is saying, this is this and that is that. We are not only allowed to do that, God assumes that we will do that. He has given us a brain to be able to look at things and say, this is this, and that is that. Where am I going with this? God created them male and female. And we are able to look at them and say, this is this, and that is that. That's taxonomy. And God gives us not only the ability but he assumes that we will do it with integrity, which is to say that's male and that's female. So in the same way, we're supposed to look at animals, we're supposed to look at whatever and put things into categories, and that's really the beginning of science. So uh, that's verse 19. Um, God brought animals to Adam to see what he would name them. That's the beginning of science. The rest of the chapter, verses 20 through 25, God ordains marriage, okay? And I want you to note the uh, phrase, one flesh there. Uh, The the man and the woman are one flesh. Let me read this passage. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet they felt no shame. Okay. Question for investigation How many or what biblical stances does Genesis 2 introduce? It introduces the fact that men and women were created distinct from each other. God created the man, and then he, from the rib, created the woman. There is a distinction. He created them distinct from one another. Second thing he did was he ordains a marriage between one man and one woman. There's an Adam and there's an Eve. And that's it at the beginning, okay? And so that is the plan, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later, okay? So God ordains marriage between one man and one woman. And then finally, within the family structure, the husband is the head of the wife. Now, it doesn't say that in this passage, but again, the word was introduces. So Adam was made, uh, the man was made, the woman was made from the rib of the man to be a helper, okay? Some of that language introduces the idea that the man, um, the, the husband is the head of the wife, which we learn explicitly from the New Testament later on. All right. Well, let's go into the second look then. So the second look segment... Tonight, I just want to 
uh, again, bring this into the New Testament and look at really a particular couple of phrases, made them male and female, and for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. There are two places in the New Testament where that is quoted, that gets brought over, and I want to look at those two places. The first one is Jesus quotes this uh, bit from Genesis 2 in Matthew 19, uh, which is paralleled in Mark chapter 10. Let's read a little bit from Matthew 19, it says, Some Pharisees approached him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? Jesus said, verse 4, Haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? And he also said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked him, did Moses command us to give divorce papers and to send her away? He told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts, but it was not like that from the beginning. I tell you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Okay, now my point here is not to teach on divorce, okay? Uh, But my point here is that Jesus is saying, okay, the ideal situation, and obviously not every situation is ideal, okay? And again, I don't want to speak to that, but the ideal situation is one man and one woman. Jesus is saying that. He's referring us back to when he says God's ideal situation for marriage is one man and one woman. He refers us back to Genesis 2, where the two become one flesh, and God created them male and female. Um, So one man and one woman in covenant for life. Okay, that also means, in addition to the question of divorce, the idea of polygamy uh, is not God's best. We see this in the Old Testament, and perhaps as we go through, we might come back to this idea. I know it's always confusing. It's confusing to me. Why do, I, why do these guys have all these wives? Okay. But, and I'm not going to get into that tonight. But the point of the story is Jesus doesn't refer, ba- refer back to Abraham. Jesus doesn't refer back to, uh, you know, Isaac and Jacob and, and the rest. He doesn't refer back to uh, Solomon. Okay. He refers back to this, Genesis 2, God's ideal situation is one man and one woman, okay? Um, Now, Paul makes this explicit in 1 Corinthians 7, where he says, each husband should have his own wife, and each wife should have her own husband. So there's a very explicit reference to one man and one woman there in the New Testament. Um, We should also point out That it is a man and a woman, and not two men and not two women, okay? The idea of two men or two women is advocated nowhere in Scripture, and it is explicitly forbidden in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, most notably Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 6, okay? That's all I'm going to say about that, but I do think that it's it's important to, to say. God made the woman to be a helper, and because it's not good for man to be alone. God made the woman to be a helper, and because it's not good for man to be alone. In other words, God wanted that idea of community within marriage. And it it is a mutual help. It's not just the woman helping the man. The man is helping the woman, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in just a second. Um. The, the, the help that they give each other, no man's not supposed to be alone. They are helping each other to assuage loneliness. And they also teach us how to help each other. Um, they, uh, marriage, marriage, that is to say. Marriage teaches us how to help each other. Marriage teaches us how to honor each other. Uh, and marriage teaches us how to live deferentially. We defer to the other person. Um, that is, if you will allow it, marriage will teach you that. 
Um, okay, Ephesians 5 is the other place where this verse is quoted in the uh, New Testament, and I wanted to read that as well. Now, Ephesians 5, of course, is the gold standard for uh, husbands and wives in terms of a teaching on that in the New Testament. So let's read it. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, we talked about the husband being the head of the wife. There it is right there. Uh, many a bad sermon has been brought on wives submitting. Notice the previous verse says, Submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. Wives to husbands. So we're all, and it's talking about the church first, submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. And now specifically he gives examples. Wives submitting to husbands. How do they do that? Uh, because the husband is the head of the wife, as the Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Okay, the key there is it's supposed to look like Christ in the church. Okay, and he says that again for husbands as well. Look at husbands, love your wives, which is a harder job, by the way, than submitting. Just as Christ loved the church and gave her, himself for her, again, the husband also gets, this is supposed to look like Christ in the church. To make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, he did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. Watch this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Quoting Genesis 2, Paul is now expounding on that and saying, this is how this applies here in marriage. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about, this is the end of the passage here. This mystery is, I'm quoting the Bible here. I'm still reading the Bible. This is not me talking. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Ephesians 5.32. Okay, so one, one flesh, marriage is a sign that points us to Jesus and his bride, and the husbands are to give of themselves as Jesus gave uh, and, give, and continually gives of himself. And so for sure, even though the wife is a helper, uh, the man is helping the wife in those respects as well. All right, so that gets us a little bit of uh, a new covenant perspective on Genesis 2, man and, and woman, and, and what it means for us today. All right, well, we're back for application of Genesis 2, uh, practical application to our lives. The prompt for this evening, imagine you encounter a transgender person. That's a woman who identifies as a man or a man who identifies as a woman. Let's say the person knows you're a Christian and takes a somewhat aggressive stance toward you in conversation, saying something like, your ideas and language are demeaning or hurtful to me. Given the truths of Genesis 2, what are some ways you might respond, both non-verbally and with words and ideas? I want to point out here that it says, given the truth of Genesis 2. So, to, to start here, we have the truth of Genesis 2 that says, God created them male and female. So, we know that. I don't think we need to bombard them with that, mm -hmm. but we have that confidence in the conversation. And so, now, with that as the backdrop... How do you then approach that conversation? Javon, you want to? Yeah, um, I would point out the fact that God had an original design mm -hmm. um, for both men and women with purposeful um, distinction and between the two. Mm -hmm. um, Non-verbally, I would honor the reality that God was pleased and delighted mm -hmm. with what he created. Mm -hmm. um, and we get to show that. Mm -hmm. um, we get to love because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. um, that It's rooted in us. So we have the opportunity to um, show that delight in his creation mm -hmm. um, within the distinctions that he made 
um, yeah. be 22. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm glad you mentioned love. I mean, I, I think that this conversation has to be rooted and grounded in love. We have to love everyone. Yeah. We, I say have to, we should love everyone. The love of God should be emanating from us. And so one of the things that I would want to try to get across in this conversation is God loves you. Yeah. Right. God created yeah. you and God loves you. And we have to be careful how we couch the the way you are. Correct. But he created you and we want to get to how did he create you? But it starts with God loves you. Yeah. Right? I agree with that. Yeah. That, that was my the first thing that I thought about was we have to learn how to love that person first mm -hmm. and foremost. Mm -hmm. And it may be a difficult love, mm -hmm. but it's still that God loves each one of us yeah. the same regardless of what we we're into mm -hmm. and it's no sin that's greater than another. Sin is sin. So we just need to learn how to love individuals and when they approach us non-verbally i mean you know i could just start the conversation off with a hug yeah. to let them know yeah. that how much i do love them yeah. and hopefully what god's put in me the holy spirit will begin to release mm -hmm. so that they would know that i'm speaking mm -hmm. from sincerity and right. not just giving them flat words right because i do care about mm -hmm. that that gender yeah. that's yeah. not male or female yeah. and they don't know how to express um, yeah. express mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah I, and so you said love you're saying caring I, yes uh, it's so important to show that we care yeah. um and, and first of all do you care yeah mm -hmm. because if you don't care um if you're the kind of person that just i'm i'm right and that's all that matters to okay. me, then you have no business in that conversation. Right. Um, but are you, uh, I would not be out to win an argument. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would be out to show love mm -hmm. with truth. Right. Because yeah. we have the truth and we stand on it. But we've got to start with loving the person. Right. While we stand on truth. We show that we demonstrate that we love the person throughout that yeah, conversation. Right. Well, I think that, you know, all of that I certainly can agree with. I thought you did a great job there. But I, I was thinking, you know, I can respect you for the way that you think. I mm -hmm. can respect mm -hmm. you for your decisions that you've made. And it doesn't mean that I don't respect you or don't love you if I don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. right. And right. so a lot of times it comes down to it's going to become an argument, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't say, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to respect you regardless of, you know, whether we come out on the same end right. of this at the end. And uh, may I share my yeah, story absolutely. now? Okay. So in my work, I do uh, electrolysis, hair removal. And so I have opportunity to see in my office, you know, people from all walks of life, mm -hmm. but not so frequently, but often I will have transgender, that would be men transitioning to women, mm -hmm and they have facial hair and other hair that they want to remove. And so, you know, I've had up close and personal, you mm -hmm. know, opportunities to be respectful because I respect yeah. all my clients, yeah. no matter of what we may disagree on, and getting to know them. And so after a while, you know, conversation may go there, it may not. Mm -hmm. One particular client that I've had, and it's been a few years back, uh, came in first just as a man and did not discuss the whole transgender mm -hmm. piece mm -hmm. and then later explained to me why all this was taking place mm -hmm. um, as time went on we had long talks over time mm -hmm. and i think he had already you know begun to trust me and knew that mm -hmm. i would be respectful yes mm -hmm. but this particular day he had lots of stats statistics that he wanted to give mm -hmm. to convince me because mm -hmm. he loved to debate anyway mm -hmm. yeah and um, I can't remember what they all were, but it was like how many police officers are transgender, how many, you know, and mm -hmm. he just went through these mm -hmm. career people. And, right. and he said, and, and all of this was an effort to try and convince me that it must be right or okay mm -hmm. because of all of these numbers. Mm -hmm. Will you just think about that, he said. And I didn't even answer him. 
And he asked me a second time. For some reason, I'm just looking at him. And then the third thing, he says, okay, I'm going to ask you to pray about it. And I said, I'll do that. Okay. So I've known him a while, of mm -hmm. course, and I did. I took that to the Lord. I prayed. Mm -hmm. I didn't answer the question for maybe a couple of weeks. This is what I felt like God said. So I went back to him and I said, I prayed about what you asked me to. Mm -hmm. And what I felt like God said was, you have spent time in the Word trying to figure out a way to be right with what you want to be right about, and you've missed the whole message mm -hmm. of how much He loves you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He didn't yeah. know what to say. Yeah. yeah. But as a result of that, as time went on, we talked more about the Bible. Uh -huh. He asked me lots of questions about the Bible. Yeah. And, you know, most of them I could, you know, answer or we come back with answers. Yeah. We never made it to anything yeah. further, but there were times that he would push a little hard and want to argue. And I said, you're putting me in the position now, yeah. you know, right. to argue with you. Right. And he would admit. Yeah. I yeah. like to be right. Yeah. I want to argue. Well, who doesn't? Who doesn't? <laughs> That's great. So you said love. You said caring. You said respect. Yes. And you said a lot of other words, too. But those were the big words. That, yeah. So when you're saying respect, I'm hearing that and I'm saying yes. And I'm, I'm saying we want to validate their story. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Without validating something that's not true. Right. Yeah. When I say validate their story... Everyone has a story of I've been hurt. Yeah. There's there there's something that has led to uh -huh. this. And we want to reach out and say, you know, I'm sorry that you've been hurt. I'm sorry for all the things that have brought you to this place and those things are not right. And uh and so I think validating the story and saying, Hey, Jesus I, I think the greatest altar call of all time is uh um when Jesus says, uh, cast all your, all your cares on me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my burden is, t take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Uh, I'm, I'm meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest and see yourself. Uh, he, he, his burden is light and your burden is heavy. Um, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. If you're heavy, and I guarantee you they're all heavy, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they might not admit it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if they if they will say, Yeah, I'm heavy, and you say, Jesus offers you a light load. Um, and if they if they, if they refuse and they say, you know what, I, I'm I'm happy with the way my life is, and then you can simply say, Well, then it sounds like Jesus is not for you right now. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus is for people who have a heavy load. Yeah. And so if you ever get to the place where you have a heavy load, Remember that he's there with a light load to exchange for you. Um, that would be some of some of the things that I would ask. These have been such great comments, and uh, I hope ever, the uh, folks online are, are blessed to uh, think through the practical applications of Genesis two. So thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.